We're going to be studying giants. Uh, our title was Though We Fight Thee with We with Giants Fight. And that comes from a, a very lovely little hymn. And and some of you might be thinking to yourself, but you know, there's so many choices in the Bible of subjects you could be studying. Why study giants? And, and some of you are probably thinking to yourself, why study giants when you could have done an in-depth study of something like dragons in the Bible? Or perhaps given us an in-depth justification of your choice of the name Phoenix for your son from the Bible. Bit self-serving, I know. Or why study giants when you could have done unicorns in the Bible? Uh, but we've chosen giants. And, and I hope that by the end of this session tonight you will see why this is a worthwhile and valuable study for us to be spending our time on over the next few nights. Some of you I know are, are already quite excited by the subject because, because you've told me about it. And, and after all, what's not to be excited about when we think about the subject of giants? Ever since we were children, we've known that any story that involved giants was going to be a good one. I'm sure most of us can remember after Sunday school, heading out into the playground or the car park with a sling, swinging that sling, pretending we were David's about to slay, slay our Goliath. Or, or that frisson of, of fear as, as, we, as we lay in bed and mum or dad read us the story of Jack and the Beanstalk for the very first time. And afterwards, after we'd had that story, and the lights went off, wondering if maybe giants were real. Maybe that's what was making that terrifying creaking underneath the bed. Because, because when we were children, giants were really scary, right? Giants, they were the stuff of nightmares. Terrible creatures who lurk in the dark, coming out to invade our dreams. Stand there in the cast of night terrors with the monsters under the bed uh, and, and, and night wolves. And, and one of my sons recently had a very, very terrifying dream that came up again and again that involved this particularly scary dog wearing a polka dot hat that would come and eat his food. Um, and, and this was a very, very scary with a scary hat. And, and so our childhood dreams were scary and giants were scary. But then we grew up. And under the scrutiny of adult eyes, these giants, they faded. And they were put away in the toy box of childhood fears. Except that, unlike night wolves and bed monsters and hat-wearing dogs. The giants were very, very real. All through the childhood of God's nation, giants roamed the rugged mountain eeries of the land. And, and there are, if we look, a surprising number of giants in the record. A surprising number of stories and named giants coming up. And, and a surprising number of heroes who uh, battled those giants. And these are some of the heroes we will uh, attempt to consider during our studies over the next few nights. Faithful men who stood up against various giants throughout the eras. Now, the first mention of giants in the whole of the Bible is in Numbers chapter, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4. So let's go there. Genesis 6 and verse 4. Now, I'm going to read this from the New English translation just because it, it makes a few of the words pop out. But if you're reading from your King James, please read along and, and you'll see why I'm doing this. And it says in in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4, the Nephilim, that's the Hebrew word there, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also after this, when the sons of God would sleep with the daughters of humankind who gave birth to the children. These were mighty heroes of old, the famous men. Now, the Hebrew there, Nephilim, or giants in, in our version, comes from a root meaning to fell. 
But, but the word's such an ancient one that, that no one really knows whether it was intended to indicate terrifying warriors who, who like mighty lumberjacks, fell all the enemies who stood before them, or whether they themselves were the fallen ones, apostates who fell away from the truth and the family of God. In this verse, the Nephilim are described as, as the children of marriages between the family of Seth, the sons of God, and the spawn of Cain, the daughters of men. And it appears that either way we choose to, choose to view this word as those that fell others or those who were fallen themselves, the word holds truth. For these famous men, these mighty men, the Hebrew for mighty men is Hagibarim. Hagibarim. They were clearly key contributors to God's assessment of the earth in verse 5 when God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. These Hagibarim, the, the Nephilim, were clearly violent apostate, fallen fellas of their fellow men. Now this word Nephilim, here in this verse, only shows up one more time in the Bible, just once. But its use gives us a much clearer picture of what made these Nephilim, the Hagibarim, these mighty fallen champions, what made them so significant. And it's in our reading tonight. And thank you, Brother Rita, for that reading. It was uh, read with uh, verve and with uh, enthusiasm, and I really appreciated that. Numbers chapter 13 and verse 33. Numbers 13, verse 33, and here's the only other use of this word in the Bible. And it says, and there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were they in their sight. So here we're told that in Hebron, that city in the land of Israel, the 12 spies saw Nephilim, the sons of one man person called Anak, which he himself was a descendant of the Nephilim. And when you think about that, there's something wrong because you see, well, clearly Anak was not a genetic descendant of the Nephilim of Noah's time. For we know that all of them had died in the flood. It wasn't that the Nephilim were extremely good swimmers and had somehow survived. No, they all perished. And yet, and yet, as Moses writes this record, there's something about these inhabitants of Hebron that he is describing as observed by the spies from a safe distance outside Hebron's walls. Something that evoked the old stories and ancient memories. So what detail do we think it was that the spies noted about those distant figures striding about Hebron's walls? What was it they saw up there on those fortifications that so filled them with terror? Well, they say it themselves. They say, as a grasshopper is to a man... That's how we felt before them. And so they must have looked upon us. The immense size of at least three of the warriors on these walls was what horrified the spies. And presumably the size of these warriors was obvious to the spies because they could compare those, those three really big ones against normal sized ones that were also on the walls. If you imagine yourself standing at a vast distance, perhaps, you know, almost at the edge of the river from Central and looking back at Central Hall and looking at someone standing on the roof of Central Hall, how would you know the height of one against another unless you could see, well, some normal heighted people and then the giants? And doubtless it was in contrast to them that they realised that these people standing on the walls were 
were giants. They looked at them and they saw that contrast. Well, how did they know when they looked what tribe these three giants belonged to without talking to them? without seeing them up close, because it would make no sense, would it, to, to walk in there and go face to face with the giants and say, excuse me, <laughs> you're very big. Uh, they're spies. That's not what you do. How did they know who these men came from? Well, it was because the Anakim were, were famous, proverbial even. This is what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 9. Moses said, go in to possess what are you going to possess? Well, it's the land of a people great and tall, says Moses. The children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest, and of whom you've heard say, you've heard the legends, says Moses, you've heard the Proverbs. Who can stand before the children of Anak? These people were so famous that even the children of Israel isolated as they were in a wilderness for 40 years and before that in Egypt for 400 years had heard the stories of these giants. And clearly in the minds of the spies, Noah's Nephilim had been giants. And these terrifying figures on the walls, well, they were clearly giants too, so in their minds, they joined the two and said, well, they must be Nephilim as well. Even we, though we know genetically they could not be. Even Moses, who writes this record, saw something there. In writing Genesis, he clearly saw a connection also. For even though he would have known that all the Nephilim of old died in the flood, he noted way back in Genesis chapter 6, that there would be Nephilim again, giant heroes of apostate violence after the flood. See what he says? There were giants in the days of the flood, and Moses adds, and, and also after this. But I think there's, a, there's another connection here between the Nephilim of Noah's time and the giants of Moses' time. There's another word that is used in the account to describe these giants, and it's in Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 10. Let's go there. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 10. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 10, God is giving commands uh, to Moses and to the children of Israel through Moses as to who they can and cannot attack and dispossess. And among the people they could, he says, the Eminem, uh, the Emmons, pardon me, dwelt therein in times past. Now, who are these Emmons? Well, there are people great and many and tall, like the Anakims, he says which also were accounted giants, just in case we weren't clear with the previous verse, like the Anakims. But the Moabites called them Emims. The Horums also dwelt in Seir before that time, and so on and so on. So what we're told here in this verse was that the Emims were accounted giants, just like the Anakim, because they were great and tall. Except that the word where it says that they were giants here in verse 11 is not the same word. It, it doesn't actually mean giants at all. Almost every other version translates this word, or should I say transliterates this word, as, as Rephaim. Here's a number. Like the Anakim, they were also counted as Rephaim, but the Moabites called them Emims. Now, Rephaim comes from a word that means to drop down as though dead. Ring a ring a rosies, pocket full of posies, tish, tish, we all fall down. It's that idea right there. And in many places, the word Rephaim is actually translated as the dead. Or the shades of the dead ones. In, in the Psalms, it's used in a poetic sense. When someone says, I am as dead, I lie amongst the dead ones. The referendum, the ghosts, 
And I think that's the point here. Because in these terrifying people, these giants, people saw a ghost, a shade, as it were, of all that had died in the flood. A reminder, a faint reminder of something that should have been dead and buried hundreds of years before, but somehow was standing before them and still alive. All that led the world to the catastrophe that it faced in the flood, it should have been dead, and yet here it was. Here they were like creatures who had climbed out of the grave. God had killed them all, and yet they still lived, it appeared. The Rapha the sons of the dead Nephilim. And so it's little wonder that when the, the spies saw the Anakim, they were horrified. It was early July, and Israel, led by Moses, had reached the edge of the wilderness. The children of Israel were camped at Kadesh, on the southern edge of the promised land, at the very bottom of, of a range of ever-climbing hills that rise like steps away to the north, peaking finally at Hebron, the highest point in that mountain range. And we know about Hebron, don't we? Hebron's an amazing city. We, we want to be there at a particular point in time because Hebron was the place of the covenant of the faithful. It's where Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah were all rolled together in the grave awaiting the kingdom. Hebron was a special, is a special place, sacred ground for every true Israelite. And for the children of Israel now, after so long away, the promised land was, was tantalizingly close. Their inheritance was just brief hours march away. The wilderness was behind them. And if we flick back one page to Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 19, it says, and when we departed from Horeb, Mount Sinai, we went through all that great and terrible wilderness which ye saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as Yahweh our God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said, ye are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which Yahweh our God doth give unto us. Behold, Yahweh your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it, as Yahweh God of thy fathers hath said unto thee. Fear not, neither be discouraged. Note that little phrase there. Fear not. Moses clearly anticipated that they would need their courage. They would need their faith. And Moses anticipated that the conquest of the promised land would hold existential threats for them. He knew there were things in this land worthy of fear. It was the people, not God, the people who suggested that they survey the land prior to entering it. it. says that in verse 22. He says, And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search us out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. It was their idea. God agreed, but their idea. And on the surface, it sounded like a good idea. Let, let's send some people in front of us. They can map out the route for us, work out the best possible route, avoid all the toll roads, make it as straightforward as possible. But you see, God knew what those spies were going to see. He knew. And yet it was up to them how they reacted to what they saw. He knew they were going to see giants. He knew they would see the cast of nightmares in the land of Israel, the shades of the long dead sinners guarding the heartland of the promise. He knew they would see that when they went up. But it was up to them how they responded. 
So up they went. Twelve spies, presumably sticking to the concealment of the craggy heights of the mountains in the early part of their journey as they marched north, fearful of being recognized and hunted. And they marched northward till they reached the border of Syria in the north, And having reached that far northern border of the promised land, they then turned, turned now south and split up and disguised by their route because, well, they they come from the north. They must be fun-loving Syrian tourists here to spend their tourist Syrian dollars in the promised land. Now disguised by that route, the visitors from the non-threatening north, not like those warlike Israelites from the south, they came southwards, uh, southwards, exploring the land that God had promised. So let's go to Numbers 13, our reading now, because Numbers 13 tells us that there were two events of particular note on their journey south. Verse 22. It says, And they ascended by the south, and they came unto Hebron, where Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan. So they saw, here's one of those notable things, they saw three giants on Hebron's battlements. This event is contrasted in the record with one other event, verse 23. And they came unto the brook Eshkol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and the figs. That's the other event recorded of the whole journey of the spies. They found a cluster of of grapes, a, a cluster of grapes so large it took two to carry it, and they found those grapes at Eshkol. And here in this cluster of grapes would have been wonderful visual proof of the fruitfulness of the land, a giant cluster of grapes. And yet the place where they found them was almost as important as what was found, because we're told here that they found these grapes at a place called Eshkol. Now, Ishkol in the Hebrew means a cluster. That is, a cluster of grapes. So, at a place called a cluster of grapes, they found a cluster of grapes. You might think, well, so what? We see this name, Ishkol, shows up in the context of the 12 spies here in this story and in the other records that talk about this story. And only in one other place in the whole scripture. Let's go there. Genesis chapter 14. Now you might think, well, we're bouncing all over the place. When are we going to get to the giant bit? Hopefully, this is all going to come together uh, in our second half. And and you'll see, second, third, and you'll see where we're going. Genesis chapter 14 and verse 13, deeper in the history of Abraham. And we're told in verse 13, And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of, and here's that word, Ishkol, and brother of Anah. These were confederate with Adam uh, with Abraham. So, Abraham's living at a place called Mamre. It's Hebron, actually. And and his confederate were some Amorites. That word confederate is a really interesting word, worth a study on its own right. It means breakers of bread. And this man, Abraham, broke bread with a group of men at Hebron, including one called Eshkol. Now, some of you will know what Abraham and Eshkol and the others his confederate do in this chapter. But for those of you who don't, here's what happens. Here's what Abraham and Eshkol and Eshkol's brothers do in this chapter. Together with just 318 men from Abraham's camp, 
They go on a wild chase to track down a vast army numbering doubtless thousands, tens of thousands perhaps, perhaps. And this army that Abraham with just 318 men chases has just done a circuit of the promised land. And in that circuit of the promised land, this vast army has wiped out tribe after tribe after tribe of giants. Look at verse 5. And in the 14th year came Kedalaoma. Now, Kedalaoma is the leader of the army that Abraham and Eshcol will chase. And the kings that were with him, and they smote the Rephaims. We just looked at that word, the shades of the dead ones, in Ashtaroth Karnaim. And the Zuzims, we're told elsewhere they were giants. And the Emims, we've read about them, they're giants. And the Horites, giants, in their Mount Seir, unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Rephaim, Zuzim, Emims, Horims, all slain by this vast army. And Abraham and Eshko and company destroyed this army. An army that was far stronger than four whole tribes of giants. And they rescue Lot. And then they head up to Jerusalem. And they meet with Melchizedek. And just after seeing giants in the very place that Abraham and Eshko lived together, Hebron, the spies get proof that the promised land is all that God had promised at a place that just happens to be named after a giant killer killer. If that makes sense, it might take a little bit of thinking. You see, God knew what the spies were going to see. He knew they would see things that were worthy of fear but it was up to them how they responded. And God gave them encouragement to trust that his covenants, his promises will always be fulfilled. Because, well, there was proof at the very place named after a man who fought with those greater than giants. And so the spies returned. Let's come back to uh, Numbers chapter 13. The spies returned, and in verse 27 of Numbers chapter 13, the spies are going to give their report. Verse 27, Numbers 13, and the spies came, and they told Moses and said, We came unto the land whither you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey. Look at the fruit of it, they say. All that God has said, it's absolutely true. This is a wonderful land, but, verse 28, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw there the children of Anak. Well, that would have been a bit of a downer, but the report is accurate. The people were strong. The cities were walled. Why, the walls are lakish. One of the places they doubtless walked past were reported to be as much as eight metres thick in places. And yes, there were giants. It was all true. Now, clearly, at this report, there was a murmur that went through the people like a wave. And so in verse 13, Caleb stilled the people before Moses. He calmed their nerves and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. A murmur has gone through the nation at the mention of Anak, and, and Caleb addresses that. But the spies have got more to say. Verse 31, the other spies, the other ten, not Joshua, not Caleb, but the rest, the men that went up with him said, you're wrong, Caleb. We be not able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we. It was up to them how they responded to what they saw. And here's how they responded. Not... Oh, 
look, Moses, it's going to be really difficult. I, I think perhaps we've underestimated the challenge here. There's no, let's not rush into this. Let's, let's set up a couple of committees and we'll, we'll work through the problem. None of that, no. It's just a simple, we cannot. And worse than that, in verse 32, they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw there in it are men of great stature. This land, they say, swallows up people, and everyone in it is huge. Most of the people here are giants. Verse 33, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and we were in our own sight, as it were, grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. The problem here is sight. They saw three figures on Hebron's walls, and now everyone looked to them like a giant. And their terrors were growing and multiplying. There weren't three giants now. There were 30. There were 300. There were 30,000. And the number of giants multiplied and the monsters came crawling out from underneath the bed. And so little wonder, in chapter 14 and verse 1, all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night. Little wonder. The whole camp had nightmares. And in verse 2, all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness? Three giants, three giants, and suddenly death was better. Verse 3 and 4, we're not going to go through it, but they start looking for a captain. A captain who's going to lead them back into the wilderness, into Egypt. And doubtless someone was saying, Cora, Cora, this is your moment. Come, come on, mate. Now you can rise up. By verse 10, they're ready to stone Moses. All the congregation bade stone them with stones. Moses, Joshua, Caleb, they want them dead. And the only thing that saves these three faithful men at that moment is the sudden appearance of something very, very familiar to the children of Israel. And yet somehow far more arresting, a cloudy pillar of fire twisting away into the sp- into the sky above them so high so tall taller than them taller than the giants taller than even hebron's walls this cloudy twisting pillar of fire a reminder of all that they had forgotten because you see in the fear in their terrible fear they had forgotten the sound of sobbing egyptians echoing down empty egyptian streets They'd forgotten a wall of red sea water towering above them. The thunder and the lightning and the earthquakes on that day. Taller than any giant, those walls. They had forgotten their victory over Amalek as Moses held his shaking hands aloft. They'd forgotten water from the rock and bread from the sky. But Caleb hadn't. Verse 9. He said, only rebel not ye against Yahweh, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. Yahweh is with us, fear them not. He says they're bred for us. What do you think he means when he says bread for us? Well, doubtless he's referring to what has just been said. This this land eats up the people in it. And he says, no, 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 we will be the eaters. But when you think about the bread that Caleb had been familiar with for the last 40 years, well, actually it wasn't 40 years at this point, but the last period of the wandering, what was it? It was manna that melted with the heat of the sun. They should fear us, he says. They will melt like heavenly bread. 
But for God, this moment was the final straw. Rather than remember, rather than choose to remember how God had rescued them from all their fears, they allowed what they saw, not not literally, but in their mind's eye. Only ten of them had seen the giants. They allowed what they saw in their mind's eye to conquer their faith. Most of the nation had not even gone near Hebron, and yet they were now seeing giants that were taller than God himself. And so in verse 22 of this chapter, God says, because all these men have seen my glory, they saw the pillar of cloud, they heard the voice over Sinai, they witnessed the fire. Because they have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. And for the next 38 years or so, their desiccated corpses will fall like autumn leaves from the tree. Their lifespans will be artificially shortened and accelerated. Their ageing racing ahead until there were none over 20 on that faithful day in Kadesh still alive. All who left Egypt who were old already had perished, save Moses and Caleb and Joshua. For 40 years almost, the children of Israel will wander the wilderness, completely safe from giants, but ravaged by God's wrath. Would God we had died in the wilderness, they said. So they did. What we want to do now is race forward in time. Because this this was the start of Caleb's story. He was one of those spies, wasn't he? But now we want to race forward. We want to move forward in time to the point in time where the generation of the wilderness is dead and Moses begins to prepare the nation for the conquest of the promised land. Numbers 21. Numbers 21, verse 10 and 11. And it says there, and Moses, uh, sorry, and the children of Israel set forward and pitched in Oboth. And they journeyed from Oboth and pitched at Ejeburim in the wilderness which is before Moab toward the rising sun. The children of Israel are now traveling up the eastern side of the Dead Sea. Verse 21, it says, And Israel sent messengers unto Sihon king of the Amorites, saying, let me pass through your lands. We won't stop at your delicatessens. We won't buy petrol from your fuel stores. We won't drink water from your wells. We won't take anything. We'll just march straight down the highway and through your land. You're completely safe, he says. Moses is not picking a fight with Sihon. He does not want to battle this king. And so the generation that grew up in the wilderness, try to march through the land of Sihon peacefully. But in verse 23, Sihon would not suffer Israel to pass through his border. He gathered all his people together and they went out against Israel into the wilderness and he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. So this here is the first battle of the new generation. And this particular battle is one that's forced upon them by Sihon, the Amorite king. It's a battle of defense. The the children of Israel are not attacking, they're defending. They, They don't want this battle. So what was their first deliberate conquest? What was the first battle that the children of Israel actually sought out? Well, it's in verse 33. And they turned and went up by the way of Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, went out against them, he and all his people, to the battle at Edrei. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Fear him not. For I have delivered him into thy hand, and all his people, and his land, and thou shalt do to him as thou didst unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So they smote him, and his sons, and all his people, until there was none left him alive, and they possessed the land. Short, sharp, 
Almost no detail. And yet I'm sure you noticed the phrase I emphasized. Fear not. Fear him not, says God to Moses. Why would they fear Og? After all, they've just, just defeated Sihon. Marched through him like he didn't even exist. Why would they be worried about Og? We'll come across now to the parallel record in Deuteronomy chapter 3. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse uh, 1 and 2. Where we're told almost the same thing. And we turned... And went up the way to Bashan, and Og the king of Bashan came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edrei. And the Lord said unto me, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people in his land into thy hand. Thou shalt do unto him as you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites. Okay, so that's, that's the same. But flick across now to verse 11, where it says... For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabah of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth thereof, after the cubits of a man. Nine cubits high, we're told this man's bed was. Okay. So we've got a bed that's nine cubits high. I want us to assume for a moment that Og was one cubit less tall than his bed. That makes sense. If you are the same length as your bed, you get stuck in it, you know, between the headboard and the foot, you get wedged in. So probably his bed was, let's say, conservatively one cubit longer than he was. He's eight cubits tall. You might be saying, eight cubits, now how long is that? Uh, it's not metric, it's not imperial. Well, eight cubits is a bit over four metres, 13 feet tall. Now, I'm going to step off the stage for a moment just to give you a sense of scale. Hopefully, most of you can see that cross up there on the roof. That cross represents just on four metres. If you were to go up the wall and then that little bit of distance out the roof and foot that up, Vertically, you'd have spot on four meters. And here for scale, from the Dan Jolly for scale, is Og. His head would be popping out the ceiling. Four meters tall. Now you might wonder, well, what's so important about his bed? Well, why is that worth mentioning? Why not just say to us, and he was eight cubits tall. That would be an easier way to describe his height, wouldn't it, than say his bed was nine cubits tall. Well, you see, we're at this point in time, we're still deep in the Bronze Age. For someone to possess any iron at all at this point in time was really something. It's like someone who's, who's, who's into titanium today. If you would have an iron bed, it would be like, well, it'd be like having a titanium bed today. I mean, you wouldn't do that. Why would you buy a titanium bed? You would only spend the enormous amount at that period of time that it would cost on an iron bed if you needed an iron bed. And Og needed it. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen a standard BMI chart. It stands for Body Mass Index. And, and what it does is it gives you a height to weight ratio, a sort of standardized height, height to rate ratio. And if you simply extend it from the height to weight ratio of a normal man today, and you push it out to four meters, and obviously none of these charts go to four meters, you'll find that if you extend this chart out all over to about here, uh, he probably weighed about 218 kilograms. But you see, that's assuming that he was built like a basketballer. Tall and thin. Most likely he was proportioned like a normal man. Properly proportioned for a warrior. Not like a thin, tall basketballer, but 
proportioned outwards as much as he was upwards. And if that's the case, this man could have weighed as much as 450 kilograms. That's why he needed an iron bed. That's why it made sense for him to spend money on a bed made of iron, an enormous cost, because a bed of wood just wouldn't hold him up. Half a ton. And add to that, it wasn't just Og that Moses was fighting. Numbers, uh, and we'll, we'll come to this, here we go. Numbers chapter 21 says this, so they smote him and his sons, plural. So there were at least three giants to fight, if not more, sons who were giants. And what this one tells us about this battle is that Og, on the way to his battle, left his capital, Ashtaroth Tarnaim, to fight at a place called Edrei. That's a funny thing to do if you think about it. Normally, your most fortified place will be your capital city. You make sure that's really strong. In order for Og to decide to leave Ashtaroth Karnaim, it means that probably Edrei was somehow more defensible, a stronger place for him to fight. You might think, well, why is that? Well, some discoveries were made at Edrei, and, and I hope you can see here on the map, Edrei. Uh, when they went to visit Edrei in the 1800s, they found something really, really interesting, because not only was Edrei most likely a massively fortified fortress, but, get this, it was also built above a subterranean fortress beneath. Here is a map. Uh, unfortunately, this map has a big fold out here, which uh, the, the people who scanned these old books didn't, didn't scan the fold outs for us. But you can see there the beginning of the map of the underground subterranean fortress and the vast stone door which led into the underground fortress beneath the city itself. So think about this. Moses, in this battle, defeated a 13-foot monster, at least two of his sons, all of his army, and in all likelihood, the battle was conducted in an underground fortress in which the enemy knew every twist, every turn, every pitfall, every trap, and had switched off the lights. If that's not the stuff of nightmares, I don't know what is. And the record says in verse 3, so Yahweh, our God, delivered into our hands Og, also king of Bashan, and all his people, and we smote him until there was none left him to remain. And that's it. It's almost like they weren't there. You see, fighting giants is all about fear. Giants are only scary because we make them huge in our minds. And in the dark, we imagined them bigger and larger than life. That's what giants are, brothers and sisters and young people. They are things that we make big and scary in our minds. The things that grow more and more threatening the more we think about them. And we started our class tonight by saying that night wolves and the like faded and shrunk under the scrutiny of adult eyes, and we put them away in the toy box of childish fears and fancies, but giants are real. And I suspect that most of us have giants that we are fighting. Terrifying figures that loom large in our minds, growing, growing bigger in the dark. Most of us have fears and doubts and anxieties and worries that prey upon us. And we feel as though we are grasshoppers before these problems. I, I have them. There's personality flaws I can't fix no matter what I seem to try. There's friendships I don't, I don't know how to improve and mend. There, there's doubts and fears about my family, about the ecclesia, about my place within them. And over the next few nights, we want to talk about giants, not just 13-foot monsters on distant battlements, but also the giants of today, because we are no different to Israel. We too face giants. 
And God knew what we would see in our lives. He knew the giants we would face. It's up to us how we respond. Franklin D. Roosevelt, the US president, who faced the Great Depression and Hitler's Third Reich, said we have nothing to fear except fear itself. He wasn't completely right, but, but he was close. In fighting giants, the problem wasn't, isn't really the giant. Giants, as we've just seen, died like anyone else. Moses, here in this chapter, an old man at the end of his life, proved that giants fell like anyone else. And David, a young man, a stripling, will prove that too with just a stone. The real problem with giants is that they make us afraid. They make us fearful. And fear itself is the giant. And God has an answer to that. He, he gave it to Moses. Fear not. Sounds overly simplistic, doesn't it? And that's, that's because it is. I want you to turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 31. And for those of you who are worrying, uh, yes, we are under time pressure. We will be finished very soon. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 7. Where Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage. For thou must go with this people into the land which Yahweh hath sworn unto their fathers to give them. Thou shalt cause them to inherit it. Yahweh is with thee. He it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Don't be afraid, says Moses. Verse 12. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and the stranger which is within thy gates, that they may hear that they may learn, that they may fear Yahweh your God and observe to do all the words of this law. Don't be afraid of them, says God. Rather, fear me. That, that's what Caleb had done, hadn't he? The whole people were afraid of giants on Hebron's walls. He said, look behind you. There is the visible manifestation of God in your camp, towering above you, taller than any giant. And you're afraid of giants? Don't fear them. Revere this. I think that seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? Don't fear them, fear me. But this was something that, that Moses understood. Moses had this happen. All the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood far off and said unto Moses, Speak you unto us. You speak to us, Moses. We'll listen to you, but don't let God speak to us lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you that, ye may, that his fear may be before your faces. And he said not. See, there it is in a single verse. Don't be afraid of the, the external terror. Revere God. And Moses understood that if we recall who God is and we bring to mind all the amazing things that he has done to save us, our personal Red Sea moment, our personal victory at Rephidim, our miracle of the manna, the giants of fear, well, we will be well able to overcome. I want to show you very quickly as we finish an example of this at work in the life of our Lord. When they sent the multitude away, they took him, even as he was, into the ship. We remember this, the Lord is exhausted. And they were also with him other little ships and they crossed the, uh, the sea and there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full but the Lord, he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. They woke him and they said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and he rebuked the wind and said, Peace, be still to the wind. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so fearful of the wind? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly 
and said to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obeys them? Can you see what happens in this chapter? Reverence replaces fear. Awe replaces terror. John said, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Sorry, that's, that's Proverbs. John says this, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. And all of us are on that journey, brothers and sisters. The journey to the promised land, we will encounter giants. And on the way, we need to learn to remember Yahweh, to revere and fear him because that will lead us to a perfect love that will cast out all fear.